Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. The Gospel reading today shares with us that story of St. Peter naming Christ for who he is. But we also know that St. Peter sometimes stumbled too in that truth. Sometimes his yes turned into a no. And so as we gather today, we're cognizant of those times that we've said no or stumbled in our faith. But today we're also given a great witness in the baptism of Vincent Peter Schmeiser. This new faith once more enriches our own faith and calls us to be better examples. And so as we begin today, I ask Vincent's parents, James and Elizabeth, what name have you given your child? Vincent Peter. And do you ask of God's church to baptize Vincent Peter? Yes. All right. Well, in doing so, you are accepting the responsibility of training him in the practice of the faith. It will be your duty to bring him up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and our neighbor. Do you understand what you're undertaking? Yes. And God, parents, are you ready to help the parents of this child in their duty as Christian parents? Yes. Very good. Then, Vincent, in the name of the Christian community, I welcome you with great joy. And in its name, I claim you for Christ our Savior by the sign of his cross, which I'll trace on your forehead, and invite parents and godparents to do the same. All right, praising God for this gift and example of faith, we lift our voices in song, giving praise to God. Glory to God in the O oh God, who caused the minds of the faithful to unite in a single purpose, grant your people to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that amid the uncertainties of this world, 
our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to Shebna, master of the palace, I will thrust you from your office and pull you down from your station. On that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim. I will clothe him with your robe and gird him with your sash and give over to him your authority. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder. When he opens, no one shall shut. When he shuts, no one shall open. I will fix him like a peg in a sure spot to be a place of honor for his family. The word of the Lord. eternal do not forsake the work of your hands Lord your love is eternal do not forsake the work of your hands I will give thanks to you O Lord with all my heart For you have heard the words of my mouth. In the presence of the angels I will sing your praise. I will worship at your holy temple. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. I will give thanks to your name because of your kindness and your truth. When I called, you answered me. You built up strength within me. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The Lord is exalted, yet the lowly he sees, and the proud he knows from afar. Your kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your hands. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given the Lord anything that he may be repaid? For from him and through him 
and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi and, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Monday was the first day of school at Notre Dame Academy, and so it's been kind of a culture shock for me to get back into the routine of waking up early maybe having a cup of coffee before people come to me and ask questions and things. So it's been kind of shaky this week, but we made it through. And of course, the first day of school is always kind of that battle of, well, do I start teaching right away or do I kind of ease in but don't want to set some kind of standard of being lazy? So I decided to play a game on the first day of school because, I don't know, games are easy, I guess. So we played two truths and one lie to get to know each other. <clears throat> so we went around, everybody took turns saying two things that are true about them and one thing that isn't true, and we had to guess what wasn't true about the person. My freshmen especially are very creative people, I learned in that game. They have just minds that are excellent, and so it was very hard to tell what was the lie and what was true. But I also found myself being caught in this trap as we're playing this game about, well, if I say this, what will people think about me? Or if I don't say that, do you think they'll think something different or, or look down on me? It was this weird kind of realization that I had playing this stupid little game with freshmen on the first day of school. But I think we all fall into that trap, right? 
No matter what it is, if it's our clothes that we buy, the car we drive, the house that we live in, the things we post on social media, what we wear to church, sometimes we get caught thinking, what will people think if they see me like this? We want to put our best foot forward. We want people to like us. We want people to feel like we're approachable or friendly. But in the back of our minds, there's always that question of, but what if they don't? What if they don't like me because of what they see? Jesus presents his disciples with two questions today. The first one, who do people say that I am? In essence, Jesus is asking, what do people, do they think that I'm wearing the right thing? Am I healing the right way? Are people spreading the word about me? What are their thoughts? Do they like me? Do they not like me? It's those questions that I was going through on the first day of school. Jesus wants to get out in the air. And so his disciples answer, well, people think that you're a prophet, like John the Baptist or Elijah or even Jeremiah. They think that you are here to announce the coming of God, the coming of the good news, someone that will save us, they think that you are here as that herald. Okay, fine, so Jesus accepts it, but then asks question number two. But who do you say that I am? And while scripture doesn't tell us, I have a feeling that there was probably a moment of silence, because nobody wanted to be the first one to say, well, I don't know, aren't you a prophet? I mean, you're kind of a cool guy, you do some cool things, right? When we have to make that move from talking about what everybody else has to say to talking about what we have in our hearts, that's the deal breaker sometimes. Because that means that we have to be honest with people. Well, you chew with your mouth open. You snore. I don't like it. You say things to me that are hurtful. I don't know how to deal with that. Right? When it's an intimate kind of question, that's when we feel most vulnerable, most ashamed, maybe. Well, so then we have Peter's response, right? He, he breaks the silence. And Peter says, well, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now those are some very particular words. The Christ means the anointed one. It means the Messiah. It means you're not a prophet. You're not John the Baptist or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. You are God. So Peter's right. He has this act of faith. His facts are true. He says that Jesus is who he really says he is. And so Jesus says, you're right. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But we know the rest of the story with Peter. He denies Jesus three times after saying that he is God. And then after the resurrection, Jesus, having breakfast with his disciples, has to ask Peter three times, do you really love me? And so Peter's act of faith today gives us an example of what it means to be people of conversion. Because we can say all we want, yeah, the church believes in Jesus. Yeah, Christians for centuries have followed the Lord. People think this about Jesus. He's kind and loving. But when it comes to our faith, what we really believe in the midst of our pain or struggle, in those really rough times or those unexpected tragedies, where's God then? Where's our faith then? See, Peter's act of faith today is one that should happen every day. One that needs to happen daily, daily conversion. Because just because you profess a faith that's great, but there's a lived quality to it that needs to be present. A daily choice 
to get up and follow the Lord Jesus, to follow the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God, the one who really came down to save us. If we weren't celebrating a Sunday today, August 27th is the feast day, or the memorial, I really should say, of St. Monica. St. Monica was the mother of St. Augustine, who's a great thinker in the church. But St. Augustine was also kind of a seeker. He spent most of his life as a non-Christian. He had fathered a child out of wedlock. He was a manichae, uh, which meant that he uh, prescribed to a philosophical thought. Uh, he was a, a, an atheist for a while. So he had this kind of crooked path on the way to sainthood, at least how we think of saints. And so Monica daily prayed for her son. Oh God, that my son might get to know you, might find you, might love you. It's a mother's prayer, I'm sure, that has been repeated throughout the centuries. Fathers, too, I'm sure, have prayed it. But it's one that we need to start praying ourselves, not for anyone else, but for us. Oh God, might my heart find its place in you? Might I be able to every day say, you are the Christ. You are the one that I want to follow. So for your discipleship opportunity today, this week, I suggest that you pray through the intercession of St. Monica for your conversion, your daily conversion, putting away um, thoughts or attitudes that might not be of Jesus, words or actions that, that don't glorify who he is. And pray that in this conversion you might find the grace to follow a little bit more closely and to have the same faith that Peter did. You are God, and I believe that, and I'm going to live my life in a way that honors it. Pray for that grace today through the intercession of St. Monica that we might all be able to acclaim Christ. We stand. For us, that first step into faith, that first act of daily conversion comes with our baptism. And all of us have the privilege today of seeing Vincent begin that journey himself. But because it's a daily decision, a daily conversion, we have to profess our faith, the faith that we hold dear and the faith that we promise Vincent we're going to witness to. And so I ask us all, do you reject sin so as to live in the freedom of God's children? I do. Do you reject the glamour of evil and refuse to be mastered by sin? I do. And do you reject Satan, father of sin and prince of darkness? I do. And do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. This is our faith. This is the faith of the Church. And we are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so I ask Vincent and his parents and godparents to join me at the font. And James and Elizabeth, I ask once more, is it your will that Vincent should be baptized into the faith of the church, which we have all just professed with you? Yes. All right. Then if you hold James over the, the big bowl here, or Vincent, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, Vincent, 
I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Vincent, just as we heard in the first reading today, the importance of kings, and just as Jesus was anointed priest, prophet, and king, so I anoint you too as a sharer in his glory and a promise for redemption. We have good days and bad days with this candle. All right, I'll hand this candle to Vincent's godfather and let Vincent see it. Vincent, receive the light of Christ. This light should be kept burning brightly in your life, and it's up to your parents and godparents to help keep it shining brightly. But it's also up to all of us to be an example of the light and love of Jesus Christ in their lives. And this white garment, too, is an example of the purity, the sinlessness of what he now enjoys, Keep that white garment unstained <clears throat> until the glory of his resurrection someday long from now. So you've put on Christ Vincent. In him you have been baptized, and we thank God for that. So the newest member of the church, Vincent James. <clears throat> you can go the candle. Yep. And then you can head back to your seats. And as a people of faith, we have faith that the Lord hears our prayers, and so we now raise them to him. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. For Pope Francis, that he hears God's voice so clearly that he be protected and encouraged and father God's flock that same as Jesus did, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us, that we will trust in the church's teaching, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to terrorism and those affected by it, that they will hear the voice of God and know that all are loved by him, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those being affected by natural disasters, that they will, God will protect them and bring them safely through, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For teachers and students returning to school, that they will know God's wisdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all married couples, that God will help them in their needs and keep them close to his love so they can witness his love, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For artists of our time, through their ingenuity, may help everyone discover the beauty of creation, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially for Lou Maccabee, that all may be enjoying the light of God in his presence, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
And if I could ask your prayers as well for Father Peter Amting, who this evening will receive the white Norbertine habit and enter our order as a novice. And also for Frater Patrick Lepaz, who tomorrow will profess solemn vows, a lifelong commitment to St. Norbert Abbey, and on Tuesday will be ordained a deacon on his way to priesthood. That for these two men, the gospel truth that the Lord is God will continue to shape their minds and hearts on their way home to him. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. O God, it is you whom we love above all things. In your great love for us, hear and answer the prayers we make through Christ our Lord. As our gifts are brought forward, please join in singing hymn number 423, How Great Thou Art, 423. 